MPS, Marinsen and Verhagen were clear about the main issue. I quote, a people without history does not exist. Every people, including the Dutch, have a history. A National Historical Museum that coherently exhibits our history does not exist. The historical consciousness in our modern society will disappear if we don't, do not change this. Due to the internet globalization, but also through individualization of society and the arrival of more people with different cultural backgrounds, it seems we do not share a common identity any longer." End of quote. In the phase following this proposal, professionals started questioning the intentions of the parliament raising issues such as globalization and the need for a broad international context in order to understand the nation's story. In 2008, a broad public discussion was characterized by the resurfacing of the disagreement on the national canon. Moreover, a group of young historians worried by the narrowing of the concept of national identity proposal a counter concept of the museum. On the other side of the barricade, some MPS considered the canon still unsatisfactory. Hence, a wide discussion spread in the press. This, it seems, I quote, is the manner in which a national museum is produced in a liberal democracy, commends Van Hasselt. Perhaps because of these debates as well, the solution presented to an important European fore and then to the web by the CEO seems to advocate prudence and to put itself forward, at least at first sight, as a more flexible and open, not monolithic, but structure by windows and uh, giving room to uh, different um, issues. However, this does not make the issue any less contentious. France provides an even more controversial example in which the community of historians reacted vehemently to the president's proposal for the creation of a house for French history and to build a canon which immediately seemed to narrow, outmoded, and still bases on the model of our ancestors, the Gauls, a model entirely unable to match the growing complexity of French society. The case of the Maison de l'Histoire de France, however, must be read against the background background of another affair, the Grand Débat sur l'identité nationale, which came into being at almost the same time. It was launched in November by the, one year ago by the Minister of Immigration, Integration, National Identity and Co-Development to foster a more shared vision of what the national identity is today and to reaffirm Republican values and pride in being French. Structured in pyramidal form, Traversing, traversing all the departments and 345 arrondissements, this debate was to have involved deputies and movements, associations, schools, citizens, and to be made virtually open to everybody by means of a website. But today, the website has been closed and the ministry has been abolished, dragged down by the collapse of the Grand Débat. The question of the Maison de l'Histoire de France, initially opposed with determination by historians, has now entered a new phase of negotiation. Just today, in fact, a seminar on the theme is being held in Paris, while a book is forthcoming in May. Contrary to the rigidity and identitarian essentialism of the first Lemoine report, to which historians of the caliber of Charlene Roche reacted harshly, also in Le Monde, it seems at present that more flexible perspectives are emerging. This is also because of the broadening of the group of historians involved, which will certainly foster a more complex, open and critical approach. The Italian proposal has been advanced without explicit reference to the two cases cited above which moreover have been ignored by the Italian press, although they're certainly not unknown to the proponents. The idea is that the Italians, I quote, are rediscovering Italy, not so much or not only because of the celebrations, but because previous reference points have dwindled, owing to a covert sense of humiliation at, and at the loss of prestige and image that we have long suffered and which induces us to react in the name of refound collective identity. 
perhaps also finally owing to growing awareness of the dreadful decay of Italy's cities and landscape. This is a quote from the proponents. Italians, again, I quote them, are engaged in a rediscovery of Italy, but they do not know where to find it. There is no particular place where an ordinary Italian can rapidly gain an idea of what the country has been and what it has represented over the centuries, where he or she can have a visual and emotional experience of the extraordinary multiplicity of Italy's forms of historical, artistic, and cultural life. For this reason, they wrote, we believe that the time has come for us to consider creating a great museum devoted to our history, the Museum of Italy's History. The proponents therefore carefully avoid using the term national in the title of the museum that they envisage and suggest. Names are important in this case, and it has been preferred to use the most neutral expression, Italy's history, which in itself indubitably leaves many and different options open. Budgetary factors may mean, however, that nothing will be done, also because of the drastic cutbacks in the art and museum sector avoided only at the last moment last week, and at the end of the temporary funding allocated to the 150th anniversary celebration. And I do not believe that a minister of culture like the one we have now, installed on March 23, is interested in such matters. We, don't, we do not know how this story just began and still ongoing will end. It is, it, it is therefore not possible to predict the results. But there is no lack of information on the context in which this phenomenon is taking shape. The 150th anniversary celebration appear a good occasion to cement together a country profoundly in crisis for several uh, points of view. First of all, I would like to mention again the extreme crisis of our museums due to the budget cuts and the government's substantial indifference towards our heritage, as uh, described some time ago by Salvatore uh, Settis. Italy, as an open air museum and a country with really great cultural resources, has in the past years also seen a deterioration of its cultural assets and museum, well known internationally. Less well known are the extremely difficult conditions in which museums of great historical and civil civil significance now languish. One may cite the almost total abandonment of the Museo di Storia della Resistenza in Rome, which is kept going only by volunteers and others besides. The economic crisis is not the only reason, however. There is also the blatant indifference of politics to Italy's heritage, although it represents a major economic uh, factor as connected with tourism. The scant concern shown by the Ministry for the collapse of buildings in Pompeii and the statements by the Minister of the Economy and Finance that, I quote, you cannot live on culture or you cannot eat culture, end of quote, have further heightened the disquiet. However, there is a second more general factor that should be mentioned, the strongly uh, polarization and the deep crisis of the political context. We have gone beyond what historians and political scientists have called with the ugly neologies, the divisivita, the, the attitude to divide themselves of the Italians, that it, their constant tendency to split on political issues. Since its birth a number of years ago, the Lega Nord has carried forward a federalist, if not secessionist discourse. To be noted is that Article 1 of the Northern League's statute approved in 2002 states as follows, Lega Nord um, has at, as its purpose attainment of the independence of Padania through democratic method, methods and its international recognition as an independent federal republic. 